Well, good morning to you, and as always, a very warm welcome to our morning worship here at Gilcomson Church. If you're joining us for the first time, then a very particular welcome to you. I hope that you'll enjoy sharing in our worship of God. We do, uh, desire always simply to direct our praise to the Lord, to hear from the Lord, to meet with the Lord, and we trust and pray that that will be your experience as we share together in our worship this morning. We're going to start by singing together to God's praise from one of the Psalms, Praise ye the Lord, for it is good. Let us join then in prayer together before God. Let us all pray. Our gracious God, uh, we're glad always to have the opportunity to join with one another in bringing to you our praise and our worship. We rejoice in all that you are, everything that you've made known about yourself. Every way in which you reveal your glory, you reveal that in the handiwork of your creative genius, which we see all around us in the beauty of the land in which we live, the vastness of the universe of which we're a part, and the order that pertains throughout. How wonderful are all your ways, O oh God, and how good are all that you do. We praise and thank you for uh, all that you reveal to us in uh, the beauty and wonder of creation. We thank you that by your Holy Spirit you've given to us the scriptures and through them again you speak to us, you reveal yourself to us, you make it clear to us that you are the God who acts in our lives and in our history, that history is indeed his story, your story. As you move forward your purposes, we bless and praise you for that, our Father. We thank you for every way in which you prove again and again your faithfulness, every way in which you reveal your wisdom, every way in which you make it clear to us that you are intent upon meeting us in our need, rescuing us from our plight, and delivering us into what you declare to be a good and spacious land that flows with milk and honey. You desire to do us good. And in the coming of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, our Father, you have revealed yourself most fully. You have come in person, come to make clear in a very uh, real way for us just what manner of God you are. 
We bless and praise you, our Father, for the love and the grace and the mercy that you show towards us in your Son. We thank you, our Father, that no matter who we are, what our circumstances are, even as you know and name the stars one by one, so you know and name each of us one by one. You know us individually. You know all the details of our lives, our circumstances. You know all the emotions in our hearts. You know where we're at as we come to you today. You know the issues that weigh upon our hearts. You know the fears, the worries that we have. You know the hopes and the dreams that we have. You know, living God, all that comprises our lives. We're glad about that. Glad that you have known us through and through in the love that you have for us. And we pray that as we draw near to you, you would indeed come by your Holy Spirit and grant to us the blessing of your presence that we may be conscious again that your heart is indeed towards us, that your spirit has been given to us, and that in and through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, there is forgiveness. We acknowledge, our Father, our need of that forgiveness, even as we gather for worship again today. Our attitudes so often have been wrong. The words that we've spoken have been hasty and unkind and unfair. The way in which we've conducted ourselves has betrayed often a selfishness and a thoughtlessness and the thoughts that we've entertained have been unseemly and out of line with yourself we come to you living god and ask that you would grant to us in and through your son our lord jesus christ that forgiveness that renewing grace and power of your holy spirit we thank you that he's given to your church to equip and enable us and empower and embolden us. We pray that he may indeed infuse our worship this day, that it may be pleasing, honoring to yourself, exalting of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and serving to magnify his great name. Grant us then, Father, please, your help, your blessing, and your presence as we ask it all through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, we will be continuing to read our way through Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus today. If you have a Bible, uh, you might like just to get that to hand so that you can follow the reading. We're going to be reading in chapter 4 today, and uh, it's uh, Kate who's going to read the passage for us. So without further ado, I'll hand you over now to Kate. It's from Ephesians 4, verses 1 to 13. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. That is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism one God and Father of all, who is over all, and through all and in all. But to each one of us grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, When he ascended on high, he let, led captives in his chain and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and be become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Thank you, Kate. It is, as I say, that passage that we'll be looking at this morning. Uh, you will find a worksheet for uh, the children, uh, and you'll find that on the website under uh, Sunday School and Resources there. If you go to Resources and uh, click on that down to Sunday School, you'll be able to find the worksheet 
for children that relates to that passage. You'll also find the Sunday School material. It's Karen that's going to be leading you through that this morning, and I hope you'll have a good time as you share in the videos and the songs and the crafts there. And uh, there's a lot there to keep you occupied, and, and I hope you'll benefit from that as you work your way through uh, your uh, syllabus at the moment. This passage, though, is very much about the Holy Spirit, and uh, we'll be thinking about the, uh, the work of the Spirit of God uh, a little bit later in our worship this morning. Uh, the Holy Spirit is a person that's uh, important for us to uh, understand. We were able to enjoy His presence in our lives, His speaking to us, His uh, being there to support and help us. He is the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ who brings to us the knowledge of the Father's love. And uh, the Bible uses a number of different pictures to try and help us understand something of the, the work that the Holy Spirit does in our lives. Um, we sometimes use pictures to speak about other people, to try and give some idea about who they are, what they're like. Sometimes we'll say about a person that this individual is a real brick. Uh, we don't actually mean that they are kind of a, an actual brick uh, in that sense. We're, we're using that as a picture to help us get some idea that this person is, is kind of solid, secure, will be uh, strong for us and will keep us safe and we can rely on that person. So we do use pictures and these are some of the pictures that the Bible uses uh, about the Holy Spirit. And um, you'll be able to work through that in the, the worksheets that uh, are there on the website. Um, uh, the picture there of the, the wind, the Holy Spirit as the wind of God, the Holy Spirit depicted sometimes as the fire of God, sometimes as the river um, and uh, that life-giving river, and sometimes also as uh, the dove uh, coming down and resting upon Jesus. Um, uh, and uh, there's the opportunity in the worksheets just to kind of think that through a little bit to see the way that the, the Holy Spirit is described and something too of his work in our lives as he changes us, transforms us more and more into the likeness of Jesus. Uh, and all of that we'll be looking at in a, a little bit more detail when we come to uh, look at chapter 4, the first 16 verses of the chapter um, in our worship this morning. But um, before we move on, we'll join to sing together uh, the song, Jesus Wants Me to Be a Bright Light Shining. Let us bow now together in prayer again. Let us pray. God, our Father, uh, we have always so much to thank you for. We thank you for the world in which we live. These last days, Father, just lovely days of sunshine and the sun lights everything up and gives to the world in which we live a luster and a brightness and a color that enables us to appreciate all over again what a, a lovely world it is, so full of variety, so full of beauty, so full of good things that you have made and given us to enjoy. 
And we thank you for that, our Father. We thank you that your heart is towards us. We thank you that you have seen our need. We thank you that in Jesus you have come to meet us in that need. And today, not least, we thank you for the wonderful gift that you've given to us of your Holy Spirit. We thank you, our Father, that you have come not simply to be with us, wonderful as that would be, but you've come to live within us by your Spirit so that we may know the immediacy of your presence. No matter where we are, what our circumstances, we may know that you, the living God, are not only at our side, but, but in our hearts and pumping the lifeblood of heaven through our very veins. We thank you for that, our Father. We, we simply could not shine at all uh, were it not for the light of the Lord Jesus himself shining within us and through us. We couldn't do anything of any significance for your kingdom were it not for the help and the enabling and the empowering of your Holy Spirit so that it is he, the Lord Jesus, who lives in us and through us rather than ourselves somehow trying to measure up because we, we can't measure up ourselves, our Father. We acknowledge that humbly. And we thank you, therefore, all the more that you have come to renew us, to restore us, to work in our lives by your Spirit and conform us to the very likeness of Jesus himself. Thank you, Father, that you take your time about that. Thank you that you work patiently with us, that bit by bit you chisel away at the hard rock of our hearts and our lives and fashion out of us the likeness of Jesus in a way that down through the ages of eternity will redound to your praise and glory. And sometimes, Father, we acknowledge it's a painful experience as you chisel away bits that are, uh, are precious to us and it's painful for us as we lose them, we uh, uh, thank you, living God, for the tender manner in which you deal with us through all our adversity and for the way in which you're able to take our adversity, take the things that get thrown against us in life, the difficulties and the sorrows and the pains and the hurts and all the problems and the pressures that there are and you take them all and you use them all as part of that shaping of our lives by your Holy Spirit. We thank you, living God, that you know us and understand us better than we know and understand ourselves and that in all our different needs this morning, you know us and are pleased to minister to us. And that's what we would ask our Father for one another and for those whose needs weigh much upon our hearts. We readily think, our Father, of those who are ill, laid aside in hospital at this time. And we want to ask, Father, please, for your own gracious, sovereign, mighty hand to be laid sovereignly upon them, imparting to them healing grace from on high, that uh, even as they, they lie perhaps in their sickbed this morning, they may have that sense that the hand of God has been laid upon them for good. Would you, would you draw near to them? Would you intimate to their very hearts, even in that healing that is ministered to them, uh, your own presence, your own love, that their hearts may indeed be drawn afresh to yourself in Jesus Christ? We want to pray, Father, for those who are grieving at this time, praying that you would grant to them your comfort in the face of a sorrow that no words can ever adequately express and convey. But you understand, our Father, you understand the groans of our hearts when that's all that our emotions can amount to, just groans that we offer to yourself. Thank you that you interpret them wisely and well. And we pray, Father, that you would draw near to all such who mourn and afford them the comfort of your own presence with them, your own care for them, your own understanding of them. And grant, living God, that uh, they may be indeed impressed on their hearts, even in their sorrow at that loss that they have known, impress on their hearts the truth of the resurrection of your Son, that they may be drawn to the one in whom alone is that resurrecting power that gives to us the hope in him of sharing in a resurrection at the last to eternal life. 
We thank you, our Father, for that prospect. Thank you that you have set us on a path that uh, is, is headed towards a glory that is more wonderful, that is more beautiful, that is brighter, more fulfilling, satisfying, and joy-filled than anything that we could possibly imagine. A life lived in your own nearer presence. We thank you, Father, for the assurance of that hope that you've given to us and pray that that may indeed help and sustain those who travel that weary path of grief and sorrow at this time. We want to pray, Father, for those who are under pressure uh, through work or through their own circumstances within their uh, families within their relationships, whatever the cause may be. The pressure can be very real, our Father. The stresses can sometimes seem well nigh intolerable. And for those who find themselves in that situation at this time, we want to pray that you would just uh, hold them up, sustain them, and grant them grace, that they may know that you, our God, our Savior, you are the one who daily bears our burdens, and would you help each in those circumstances to be able to, to lay their burdens, lay their pressures upon the Lord Jesus Christ and find that he carries them with them as they press on day by day. We thank you, living God, for those who serve us in our society in so many different facets. In these days, we've certainly become very aware of that interdependence that we have upon one another, the, the range of different services that different individuals provide. And we pray, living God, that you would help those who orchestrate the infrastructure within our communities. Not least, Father, we pray for those who serve on the council, that you would give them the wisdom and the help and the stamina that they need and the responsibilities they exercise, that they may uh, be enabled to orchestrate the whole infrastructure in a way that makes for the true welfare of our community as a whole. We pray, our Father, for business leaders, conscious that on them must fall difficult and weighty decisions and responsibilities in these days as they seek in the context of a lockdown and all the ways that that has had repercussions on their business. We pray that you'd give them wisdom, that you'd give them strength and stamina, that you'd give them much grace and patience and that you'd help them as they seek to, to move forward their particular sphere of service within our society. We pray, Father, for the government uh, of our land, both uh, at Holyrood in Edinburgh and down at Westminster as well. We pray for those who exercise those responsibilities and ask that you'd give them daily grace in the fulfillment of those responsibilities, that they may know your hand upon them in these days. Grant them that wisdom that they need, our Father, and help them as they seek to provide that lead for us at this time. Have mercy, we pray, our Father, upon us as a nation in these days. Have mercy upon the nations of the world in all the vast range of need that there is, the poverty that so many face, the cruelty to which so many are exposed, the adversity of one sort or another that so many are afflicted with. Help and save and rescue, we pray you, and grant your hand upon all who seek to minister into those arenas of need as we ask it all with all the unspoken prayers of our hearts through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, before we turn to the, the word of God again, uh, we're going to join to sing a hymn that, that seeks the help and the presence and the ministry of the Holy Spirit himself. Spirit of God, attend, Spirit divine, attend our prayers.
we will now be turning to look at the, the Word of God in Ephesians 4. Again, if you have a Bible to hand, you might like just to get that uh, out and have that available so you can follow through as we work through this passage, the first 16 verses in Ephesians 4. But um, as always, we, we never uh, jump into this, um, presuming that we have the ability ourselves to comprehend all that the Lord is saying to us and revealing to us in his word. And we do, therefore, consciously, not as a ritual, not as a kind of routine thing, but, but very deliberately um, look to him and ask him for his help. So let's just do that as we turn to his word now and join in prayer again. Our Father, um, we thank you that you have given to us your word, that it's not just any uh, old book, uh, not just a source of information, not just a source of interesting stuff from a bygone age, but it is your word through which you not only reveal yourself to us and your purposes to us, but you speak by your Holy Spirit. And what a wonderful thing that is, our Father. And we uh, ask in the name of Jesus that your Holy Spirit himself would indeed be doing that that he would come as we've just been singing, that he would come in a way that is plain as daylight, clear as crystal, that he would come and speak through his word to our hearts today, to encourage us, to uplift us, to strengthen us, to fortify us, to fashion in and through us the likeness of Jesus himself, that uh, he may indeed reveal to us the glory of your face, so would you draw near to us and grant us that blessing and help now as we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The reason why we've been working our way through the letter to the church at Ephesus is because um, we are intent, really, under God as we sought to see where God means to take us, what God is intent on doing in us. The, the next step involves for us recognizing under God that by his grace, we will be a family. Uh, we will be experientially a family. And during this time of lockdown, when the one thing that we're not able to do is actually come together and meet together and enjoy being with one another, uh, it is almost as if the Lord simply takes us aside and says, now I want to teach you um, what the truth is about you as a fellowship, what it is that is true about you as believers. You are my family. And the letter that Paul writes to the church at Ephesus is in many ways the, the single um, book in the Bible that most clearly expounds for us the nature of the church. And the, the picture, the, the underlying picture that runs the whole way through the letter is that of the family. Uh, God is our Father, bringing us into a family and enabling us as his children through Jesus, his Son, to come to him as our Father. Uh, that is the undergirding picture. And, and one of the great, great glorious truths about that family is that we are a people who are now indwelt by the Spirit of God. Um, today is Pentecost Sunday the day in the Christian calendar when we celebrate that remarkable, wonderful, staggering gift that God has given to his church whereby he has poured out his Holy Spirit upon his people, each and every one, and has come to reside in us, to make his dwelling with us and in us come to be living by his spirit in our lives. So uh, within the heart and within the life of every Christian, uh, we have the almighty, all great God coming to live within us. And Paul has underlined that at the end of chapter two. He's uh, spoken of that in chapter three already. And uh, as we move into chapter four, it is this truth that really uh, lies behind all that he is going to be saying in the verses that we'll look at today. And so it's quite appropriate that on Pentecost Sunday, we're able to, to see something of the nature of the work of the Spirit of God in our lives. Uh, and that's how we're going to look at the, the passage here in Ephesians 4 this morning, um, seeing the, the activity of the Spirit of God in the lives of God's people. 
And I hope that as we look at this and as we work our way through that, something of the, the sheer privilege that is yours as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ will be impressed on you. Something of the, the enormous potential as well will be impressed on you, that you'll be encouraged, that you'll be excited, that you'll be enthused in the knowledge this is the abiding reality about you, that you are as a believer, that we are as a fellowship, we are indwelt by the Spirit of the living God. God. He has come to make his dwelling with us and live his life in us and through us and for his own greater glory. And the, the way the passage divides up is, is really quite straightforward. The first six verses speak about the life of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the next verses 7 to 12 speak about the gifts of the Spirit and the final verses 13 to 16 speak about the fruit of the Spirit. And broadly speaking, um, through the teaching of the, the Scriptures, uh, these are the three major strands that the, the uh, Bible sets out in terms of the activity of the Spirit of God in our lives. Uh, he makes us alive, he gives us gifts, and he causes fruit to be born in our lives. Uh, he does a, a wonderful work in our lives. And so is that the, the, the kind of framework for the passage that we'll look at? Um, if you take a look at verses 1 to 6, first of all, you'll see that there Paul is really speaking about the life that the Spirit of God has given to us, the life of the Spirit. Um, and in these Opening six verses, he says these three basic things about that life that the Spirit of God has imparted to us. Number one, uh, he is saying, you have been made alive by the Spirit of God. Um, you were dead, um, and in many ways, he's really just uh, articulating in verse one. He's articulating what he has expanded on in chapter two, verses one to 10. He said, you were dead, but now you are alive. God has made you alive. And that is your calling. When he says here, um, live a life worthy of the calling, um, that's the calling that he's talking about. Uh, he's not calling about some sort of vocation as to whether you're gonna be a teacher or a doctor or a plumber or whatever it may be not that sort of calling, but rather the calling whereby God called you out of death into life. God called you out of darkness and into the, the, the kingdom of his beloved son, into the light and the glory of his son. It's that call of God whereby he has made you who were dead alive. Um, it's that calling that he's talking about. That's the reality about you. The spirit of God has made you alive, has given you a new life, has made you a new person, brought you into a new relationship with the living God and given to you that new life. And it is he who now comes to live within your heart and to live that life uh, in you and through you. And so when he says here in verse 1 that I, I, I beseech you to live a life worthy of, he's not saying that you and I somehow have to pull our socks up and be worthy. He's saying learn to live a life that corresponds to the life of the Spirit of God. Learn to live your life uh, in such a manner that it is no longer you that live it, but it is he who is living that life in you and through you. So you're, you're constantly saying, well, uh, okay, Lord, so what do I do here? You do this for me. You teach me. You show me. You speak through me and so on. We are relying on him. We're saying, no, I'm just going to take a back seat here, Lord. You live your life. Uh, and that's what he means by saying uh, live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Learn to, to live that life that you now have through the Spirit of God. In verse 2, he, he adds a further dimension to this and says that the, the Spirit of God has not only made you alive, he has effectively pulled you together. Um, he, he delights the Spirit of God. He delights just to, to pull things together. And, and we certainly need that because our lives very often, um, certainly outside of Christ, our lives are all over the place. Um, they can be a total shambles. Um, uh, sometimes are kind of respectable shambles, but they are really all over the place. Um, so that what we intend to do doesn't match what we actually do. What we want to do doesn't correspond to, to the, uh, the, uh, the way that we actually live out our lives. Uh, our lives are all over the place. And the Spirit of God just pulls us together. He, he delights to do that. And, and he, he has brought together Jew and Gentile in a, in a most remarkable fashion. That um, would have been, in the ancient world, that would have been unthinkable. If you'd ask someone in the 
street, you know, do you think that Jews here and Gentiles can ever get on? They just said, that, no way, that's just not going to happen. And, and Paul is saying, well, it, it just did happen. Um, it has happened. The Spirit of God has pulled you together. And so in verse 2, he's saying, um, learn to live that together life. Learn to work at that togetherness. And what he points to there in verse 2 are these, these four different components of that uh, harmony that the Spirit of God creates. Um, you will need humility, whereby you're not pushing yourself forward and thinking that you're the, the one through whom the whole world uh, revolves and around whom the whole world revolves. Uh, be humble, be gentle uh, in the way that you speak to people, the way you speak about people, the way you relate to people, the way you engage with people, that gentleness an important part of that. Uh, be patient with one another. Um, be patient in the midst of your circumstances. Don't lose the rag. Don't uh, uh, suddenly panic because things don't seem to be going your way or whatever. That patience and also being forbearing towards one another. Um, uh, recognizing that, uh, that the, the other person is, is a different personality, comes from a different background, will approach things in different ways, and maybe doesn't actually mean uh, exactly what you think or take they, their meaning to be from what they have said or what they have done. They maybe didn't mean to hurt you, even if they did hurt you. Be forbearing with one another. Uh, it's the togetherness that he is talking about. The Spirit of God has pulled you together. So uh, learn to work at that togetherness. And it is really the, the kind of four part harmony that he is talking about here, that humility, that gentleness, that patience, that forbearance. And if you've uh, engaged in that four-part harmony, um, it's, it's a lovely thing when it, when it works, where each individual is, is actually singing a slightly different uh, uh, line, but the, the, the four lines are all combining together. And in four-part harmony, you can't simply do your own thing. Um, you, you sing the same tune, uh, you sing the, the same uh, score, as it were. You, you can't just say, well, I, I prefer this, this tune to that song, and, and you prefer that one. Uh, you, you combine together to sing from the, the same score, but you are uh, utilizing your particular forty in a particular way and combining together in that manner. And this is classic four-part harmony that Paul is talking about in verse 2. The Spirit of God has brought you together to be, uh, to be that body, as it were, who, who kind of sound out a harmony that uh, resonates with people and, and kind of reminds them that there is a God who brings things together. So it is that togetherness. It doesn't happen automatically. You've got to work at that. Um, but that's the life that the Spirit of God has given. He, he not only makes us alive, he pulls us together. And thirdly, verses 3 to 6, he makes us one. Um, that unity of the Spirit in the sense that, uh, that it's he who creates it. It's, it's not uh, that God says, come on, get your act together and, and try and get on with one another and be one um, uh, it's not for us to create that unity. It's a unity that the Spirit of God creates. He makes things one. That is the, uh, the kind of hallmark of all that the Spirit of God does. Um, the, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one. Uh, Jew and Gentile made one. Uh, the Holy Spirit loves just to, to bring together in such a way that he actually makes one out of uh, two and out of three and out of many uh, in that manner. Uh, so it is the, the unity that is already there that has been created by the Spirit of God that Paul is speaking about. And he elaborates a little bit on that because he recognizes that in any fellowship, whether it's at Ephesus or at Gilcomston or the other side of the world from you, it doesn't matter. Where, wherever there is a body of believers, they will be very different in all sorts of ways. Uh, they will have different personalities, they'll have different backgrounds, they'll have different tastes, they'll be different in a whole multitude of different ways. And, and that's part of the, the beauty of the world that God has made, that enormous variety. He's not talking here about a uniformity, that we all suddenly become stereotypes and, and just all say and speak in the same way. We're, we're all different, and uh, we are to delight in that difference. But there are certain things that are common to uh, the family of God. In the same way as within any family, um, there will be differences. Um, I, I'm one of four children in, in our family, and we are all different. Uh, I'm the tallest, 
uh, by, by quite a long way. I'm not the oldest. Uh, I, I bow always to my older sister, who is the, the oldest. Uh, she kind of heads it all up. We're all different. Um, and, and you would recognize that we are very different, different personalities, different uh, uh, and, and looks in a lot of ways as well. But the, there are certain things that are common to us, certain oneness about us, because we all have that same blood flowing through us. We all have that same origin. We are all born to the same parents. And uh, it's that oneness that Paul is talking about here in verses 3 to 6. And he elaborates on where that oneness lies. One spirit brings you into one body. You are part of that one body of Jesus Christ. And there are therefore always, for those who have been born again of the Spirit of God, those who have been born by the Spirit of God and made alive in God's family, there are these five different features of that oneness. Five things that are always true about the children of God. Number one, um, you are looking forward to the return of Jesus. That's the one hope that we have. And, and that's flagged up right at the head of these four because that is, that is basic to who we are uh, as a people. Um, born by the Spirit of God, not simply to enjoy God's presence here and now, but with the prospect of something that is still to come. And so we have that hope, the return of Jesus. We are looking forward to his return. Uh, you find in Paul's letter to the church at Thessalonica uh, in chapter 1, he uh, he articulates very fully there uh, what it is that God has done, how the Spirit of God has worked in power as the message was proclaimed and brought about that change. They have been converted. And he describes towards the end of that first chapter what that conversion looks like. He says, how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Um, and he's, he's simply saying that's, that's the distinguishing feature about a Christian. You are waiting for, you are looking forward to the return of Jesus. You are not thinking that somehow God is going to do it all in the here and now. Uh, you are recognizing that it's, it's in the future still that the promise of God is fully, most fully realized. So that's the first uh, of the, uh, the things that those who are born of the Spirit of God have in common. You are looking forward to the return of Jesus. Um, it's, it's a sadness in many ways that so little is taught about the return of Jesus in the Christian church these days when it is so basic to the New Testament proclamation of the message. But that is the first of the, uh, the, the uh, characteristic um, points of unity that Christians have. We are looking forward to the return of Jesus. Secondly, we have um, um, submitted our lives to the Lordship of Jesus. We are living under the Lordship of Jesus. One hope, one Lord. Um, we no longer are, are calling the tune ourselves. We are saying, Jesus, uh, it's your way, not my way. Your will, not my will. What do you want me to do? Uh, how do you want me to live? What am I to do in this situation? You show me, you teach me, you, you direct my path. I'm yours, you, you teach me. We are living our lives under his lordship. We don't always get it right. We make mistakes, we go astray. That's all part and parcel of it. But our lives have been submitted to his lordship and we are living our lives under him. Um, that is basic, again, to a Christian. Uh, every Christian, no matter that they are different in all sorts of ways, that's the truth about them. Um, one hope, one Lord. Thirdly, uh, one faith. And uh, he means by that we are leaning on always the grace of Jesus. Not our works, we are living by faith. We are trusting Jesus to have done for us what we could never do ourselves. We don't presume to be able to earn our salvation. We don't presume to be able to, to merit by our performance God's favor and God's goodness. We are leaning entirely upon the Lord Jesus Christ and upon his grace and we are living our lives in that light and by that perspective is by grace that we are saved and we are leaning on that grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
one hope, one Lord, one faith, uh, one baptism. And uh, by that, Paul means that we are laying hold of the promise of Jesus. So you have the return of Jesus, you have the lordship of Jesus, you have the grace of Jesus, and you have the promise of Jesus as well. Uh, we're not going to get sidetracked about who should be baptized. Is it just believers or is it the children of believers and things like that? Um, don't get uh, led astray by, by any of that sort of stuff. That's not what Paul is talking about here. The baptism is the sign of the promise of God. And it is as the sign of the promise of God that we, uh, we unite um, whatever our different interpretations may be about the actual baptism, the manner on the scope of the baptism. What it signifies is the promise of God, and it's that that we hold on to. We are a people who lay hold of the promise of God, who rely upon the promise of God. The whole Bible is a promise, basically. It is the promise of God that he will be our God, that he will grant his blessing, that he will forgive us, renew us, remake make us and bring us safely out of our slavery, out of that bondage, through the, the wilderness of this life as he teaches us, trains us, and bring us finally into that promised land that, has, uh, uh, that is, is full and glorious. That's the promise, and we are laying hold of the promise of God uh, and, and uh, live our lives on the basis of that promise. And finally, um, one father uh, one God and Father of us all. Uh, we are a people who, are, who, who love being with the Father. We've come to enjoy the Father himself, come to know him not simply as some distant God, not simply as the great creator, not simply as king, but the one who is creator, the one who is king, we've come to know also as our Father, and we love being with the Father, as Jesus himself loved being with his Father. And, and that says, Paul, um, that's, that's the unity that the Spirit of God has created. Um, he, has, he has brought us to that newness of life, whereby in pulling us together like that uh, and, uh, and bringing us to new birth, he has given us these, these common characteristics. Uh, we, we are looking forward to the return of Jesus. We are living under the lordship of Jesus. We are leaning on the grace of Jesus, laying hold of the promise of Jesus, and loving being with the Father of Jesus. That's the life of the Spirit. Secondly, in verses 7 to 12, the gifts of the Spirit. The, the Spirit who brings us to newness of life and who brings us out of deadness into life and who calls us into life is the Spirit who also gives to us gifts. Now, there is a load, obviously, that we could say in relation to this, but uh, uh, we'll stick to the text of what Paul says here. To each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. And he explains why in verse 8, quoting scripture from the Old Testament, and so Christ uh, himself gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service. To say there's, there's a load that we might say about this, but uh, uh, back to basics here, what Paul is on about are, are these three things. Number one, the scope of these gifts. And you'll see there that Paul underlines that it is uh, to each one of us. Uh, there's not a single Christian that kind of gets left out. Uh, every single Christian has been gifted by the Holy Spirit in one way or another. Uh, there are various different lists that the Apostle Paul gives through the, uh, the New Testament, uh, lists of the, the different gifts of the Spirit of God. He lists some of them here uh, when he speaks about apostles, prophets, uh, evangelists, pastors, teachers, and so on. Uh, but there are other lists in Romans chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12, for instance, uh, lists of, uh, of the ways that the Spirit of God gifts. And some of them are uh, to do with administration, some of them to do with hospitality, some of them to do with faith, some of them to do with generosity, and so on. A whole range of different gifts are just a plethora of gifts because the, the Holy Spirit has, has a, a vast repertoire of gifts that he just loves to bestow upon his people and to each and every one of us. Uh, the Spirit gives his gifts in order that we, we may indeed be, be able to share in the body of Christ and share in all that Jesus is doing and be part of all that he is doing. And so he gifts us in that way. 
Uh, Christianity is not a spectator sport. Um, it's not a case of coming along and sitting and, and just uh, listening in and, and learning and things like that. Um, we all part, have a part to play. We all have gifts that the Lord has given to us in that manner. So that's the scope, first of all, that we need to be clear about. It's not that some people are really gifted and others just kind of miss out. Everyone is given a significant gift um, and gifts plural. Um, they, they may not be kind of dramatic ones. They may not be frontline ones. They may not be ones that we, we kind of uh, rave about in one way or another, but they are all important. They're all significant. And each Christian is gifted to each one. Um, we are gifted. Then secondly, there's the source of his gifts. Um, you see how Paul puts it there. Each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. In other words, it is Jesus, not you, uh, who determines what gifts are given to you. It's not like he, he kind of bids us come into his um, his great storehouse and says, uh, take a look around and see what, what do you fancy here? Which, which gift would you like? Um, we don't get to choose the gifts that he gives. We don't get to say, well, you know, I kind of like that um, or whatever it may be. He says, no, uh, I, I, I am giving you these gifts. Uh, his gifts are, are in, tied up with the, the call that he has upon our lives, what he means us to be, what he means us to do in our lives. He gives the gifts appropriate to that, whatever they may be. And uh, he's the one who determines what they are. Uh, all of the gifts that he has, uh, that he gives, have their, their upsides and all of them have their downsides. Uh, all of them have um, uh, aspects about the exercise of them that, that bring enormous fulfillment, that uh, serve the purpose of God well, and all of them have a cost of one sort or another. Um, so that although we may, in the exercise of our gifts, be thinking, well, you know, I kind of wish that I, I'd been given some other gift that was less costly or less demanding. Uh, there aren't any gifts that are less costly, less demanding. All the gifts of God are costly in the exercise of them. All the gifts of God are significant and fulfilling in the exercise of them as well. It is Christ who apportions. And then thirdly, in connection with the gifts of the Spirit, uh, the significance of them. And you'll see here that uh, what he points to is the way that these gifts are given for service. They are given that we may the better serve the cause of the gospel. Um, it is that we may be equipped and enabled to serve all of us. And that you see is how he puts it there in uh, these verses, verse 12 there, to equip God's people for works of service so that we may be enabled to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, to serve the cause of the gospel, to serve the kingdom of God. And uh, these gifts are given to that end. And that really is why at this particular point, he, he illustrates by reference to, to the gifts uh, that, that really have to do with the release of the word of God, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Um, he is talking about the, these gifts because these are primary in the sense that, that they equip God's people to exercise their own gifts. Uh, that's why he he illustrates by reference to them here, not because they're the most important ones, and they're the ones that really matter, uh, and nothing else really matters to the same extent, but rather because they are primary in the sense that, that they release and equip and, and fashion in the, the lives of God's people the particular gifts that each and every one has been given. Um, they, uh, the word of God, as it is taught, as it is applied, as it is ministered, both through the evangelist, both through the teacher, those who bring a prophetic ministry, whatever it may be, as they exercise that ministry of the word of God, they serve, first of all, to bring people to Jesus and then to build people up in Jesus and uh, equip them that each and every one may then be the better enabled to go and exercise their gifts in the service of Christ himself. Enough on that because uh, we want to cover in the closing verses 13 to 16 uh, what I've called the fruit of the Spirit. Again, 
Um, Paul speaks elsewhere um, slightly more fully. For instance, in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, he speaks there about the fruit of the Spirit, the ninefold fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, uh, gentleness, uh, and self-control, and so on. Um, Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23 speaks more fully and in greater detail. What he's doing here in these closing verses of this passage, 13 to 16, is really putting it in summary form and speaking there about the, the way in which the, the Spirit of God produces a maturity in us. In the same way as if you, if you plant a, um, an apple tree, for instance, um, you're glad when you see the, the tree beginning to, to grow, you're glad that it's alive, glad that it's kind of got leaves and got twigs and got branches and so on. You're glad to see all of that, glad even to see the blossom that comes on it. What you're really looking for is the fruit when there is that maturity. And um, you plant an apple tree, it's going to take a few years before you get there, that maturity. But the maturity is seen in the fruit. And it's the maturity that Paul is talking about here. Uh, the Spirit of God creates that maturity, what he el uh, elsewhere calls the, the kind of being made perfect, being made whole, being made complete, that being made mature. And it's that that he's talking about here. And what he, what he flags up really are these, these four major characteristics of maturity. Let me just uh, uh, instance them for you uh, before we, we close this morning. First of all, there is and there will be a priority in our affections. And uh, that will be in the knowledge, the, the relational knowledge, the intimate relational knowledge that we have of the Son of God. We will be increasingly preoccupied with the Lord Jesus. We'll be increasingly delighting in him. Um, and remember, that this is not an aspiration that God says, come on, that's what you need to be doing. Um, Paul is saying, that's what the Spirit of God does. And, uh, and that is the hallmark of that maturity. You will have a growing delight in and a growing focus on the person of Jesus. You will delight in him. You will love to speak about him. You'll love to enjoy him. You'll love to serve him. You'll love to be with him. You'll love to learn from him. You'll love to uh, enjoy every part of that relationship with him, uh, that knowledge of the Son of God. That's what he speaks about there. That's the first thing, a priority in our affections. Secondly, a clarity in our understanding. The second of the hallmarks of that maturity, a clarity in our understanding. That's what he means, I think, there by uh, the faith, the unity of the faith. It is uh, that definite article interposed before the word faith in his letter. The faith, the, the kind of substance. Uh, we're no longer tossed around by the latest idea that comes this way. No longer left thinking, well, maybe that's true, maybe that's true, maybe we should go with that type of thing. Uh, no longer tossed around, he says, this way and that with every wind of teaching. But, but we have that clarity in our understanding. Uh, about who Jesus is, what he's done, why he matters, and how God works out his purposes in our lives and in his world. That clarity in our understanding. Thirdly, uh, an integrity in our living. I think that's what he's talking about when he there speaks about our speaking the truth in love. Instead, uh, speaking the truth in love, verse 15. Uh, we will grow to become in every respect, the mature body of him. Um, that really has to do with an integrity in our living. Not just in the way that we speak, but the way in which what we say matches how we live. Um, and, and all of that characterized by a, a love, a, a concern for those around us as well. There will be that integrity. Our lives more and more conformed to the pattern of God's way of doing things that the Bible sets out. And then finally, a generosity in our relationships. Um, we will be concerned for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. It'll be his body, his headship in our lives that we are aspiring to, concerned for his glory and committed to the welfare of others around us. Uh, we will seek to build them up. We'll be concerned in, in the choices that we make and the actions that we engage in, the things that we say, concerned to build up those around us. And all of that is, is the work of the Spirit of God. 
He's the one who, who conforms us in that way to the likeness of Jesus, who creates that maturity in us. He's the one who's made us alive. He's the one who bestows these gifts upon us. He's the one who makes us mature in that manner. The life of the Spirit, the gift of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, all there for you in Ephesians 4, verses 1 to 16. Um, and that's, that's the life that we live as the family of God. We are a people who know and enjoy to the full the ministry of of the Spirit of God who has come to dwell within us as individuals, as a fellowship, and we are to rejoice in that, to rejoice in him and say, Jesus, uh, you lead us, you teach us, you equip us, you enable us, you grow us, and please God, that's what we shall see, a family that is growing in the likeness of Christ and growing for the glory of God. May he bless his word to all our hearts. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you uh, particularly for the ministry of your Holy Spirit. And thank you that he uh, wonderfully makes us alive. And Father, if there are those um, even listening in today who, who are just conscious that there's a deadness about their lives, would you come by your Holy Spirit, even through your word, simply use that word to be the means that you call them out of that deadness into life today? as you speak about the gift, the promise that you have made to your people, that in Jesus, you give your Holy Spirit, you come to dwell with your people. Would you help us, each one, to, to recognize our gifts? Would you help us as a fellowship to, to utilize the gifts that are represented amongst us? And would you grow us, Father, into that maturity? and enable us in our day and generation to serve you in such a manner that Jesus is indeed glorified and his kingdom wonderfully extended. And we ask it for his name's sake. Amen. Well, let's close our worship by singing together the song, O Church, Arise.
as always, I hope that you've enjoyed sharing with us in our worship here this morning. There uh, is the opportunity immediately now after this service to join others in one of our Zoom rooms. If you haven't already got the ID uh, number for the meeting, that Zoom room, then uh, do just uh, give a, uh, a text to the number that uh, you'll find on the screen and we'll make sure you get a note of the meeting ID and also the password. Um, for your interest as well, if you, you like just to go over the material that we look at on a Sunday, you will find on the website, uh, again under resources, the material for the community groups. Each week we have uh, groups who, who meet, the community groups, we break up as a congregation into these different groups and take the opportunity to explore further the passage we've looked at on a Sunday and uh, you'll find those resources on our website as well. Our evening service tonight, as usual, half past six, we hope that you're able to join us then. And meanwhile, uh, from here, may you go in peace uh, and may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and always. Amen.